invite our invited guests, our special guests, to take their seats so that we can begin the program. to Upper East, Dr. Abia Inso, here with us. <laughs> Our keynote speaker, Minister of State at the Presidency, in charge of PPP. If you don't know what PPP is, it means you don't have to be in this room. <laughs> He's also a member of parliament for our central, but seriously, public-private partnerships. The Honorable Rashid Elvo. And um, I'll introduce her better when we are coming to hear from her. But we have our chairperson, Dr. Mrs. Ellen Hagan, also here with us. <laughs> now, as I said, um, there's an implementing partner, but then there's also a funding partner who originates the idea. And we're very privileged to have from, they are now called UK Aid. They used to be called DFID. I think the change of name means they'll give us more money. So, uh, we have Sally Taylor, who is the head of David or UKA. We're also very happy to have a deputy minister and a member of parliament for the constituency with the most exciting internal politics. <laughs> the constituency that produces Ghana's world champions, MP4. Now, First time I saw him, he was doing boxing commentary. Last week I was in his constituency and he has sponsored local games. He's the Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry. Honorable Neil Antevan as well. Because of the importance of this program, we have lots of key stakeholders here with us. I'll just run through a few of them. I recognize by face the former president of the AGI, Nana Afari. Nana Afari. She's a marriage counselor, she's a mother, she's a speaker who has, on average, is it five speaking engagements a week, possibly more. She's a proud alumni or alumna of Wesley Girls High School. Ladies and gentlemen, add. You want me to add Mensa Saba Hall? Yes, yes. So she's a, what's the female of a Viking? A Vikingess. So she's a Viking. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mrs. Serengeta. Distinguished members of the high table, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this morning. I have been privileged to be a witness or a participant of several graduation programs in the past. The last one I attended was with the University of Ghana. And I recall that there were about 4,000 graduates that were being turned out. And as I sat there, I haven't included the people who were from the master's program or for the science programs. This was purely um, the people from the business and um, general arts. And as I sat there, I was wondering, where are all these people going to get jobs? And you know, Lene Services is the leading HR company in Ghana now, and we are uh, into the business of looking for jobs for people. We call ourselves organizational doctors. So we come into your business and then we try and turn, do diagnostics, and then together with you come up with some uh, medication or remedies to, to get your business to grow and get better. So as I sat there, I was wondering, where are these people going to get jobs? 4,000. And you know, there are over 55 universities in Ghana now. The, the list keeps getting longer. So if 
each of them were to turn out 4,000. Just do the maths. There is a crisis in the world of work. I always have a box of tissue on my desk because I have people who have one, two, three masters sit in front of me and weep. So the tissue box is there for that purpose. <laughs> on a weekly basis. I'm on a mission, ladies and gentlemen. And um, we need to shift our mindset. We need to get parents to encourage entrepreneurship because that is the way to go, to create jobs. Some of us have to create jobs for other people. Otherwise, we will have what we are having now in our country. So I doff my cup off to you, the stakeholders here, who are giving us examples of entrepreneurs we can be proud of, giving encouragement to people who can start their own businesses so they can be part of um, this program, Enhancing Growth in New Enterprise. I've been asked to say a little bit of my story. Unfortunately, I don't like talking about myself. But what I would like to share is that usually, from my experience with the youth, I've seen that we are churning out a new breed of young people who are really creative, who are not intimidated by what we think are limitations in the, in the world of work. They don't think about funding, they don't think about, they only go for the business ideas. So we have TechnoServe helping people to birth the ideas. I have um, brought up a lot of um, businesses since I, I birthed learning services. What does an entrepreneur do? We look at problems in the society and we come up with solutions for them and make money out of it. So people have noticed or come up with business ideas, uh, business ideas that will solve problems. But um, sometimes these businesses start and they fall by the wayside because they don't get the uh, enabling environment to be able to get it to grow. I know we are trying, but the room for improvement is still the biggest room. So I discovered, for instance, that where women are concerned, um, we need to be encouraged to be hungry for leadership positions. And it's about shifting the mindset. We, we are just not hungry. And the society has put us in boxes. So I decided to set up like the crazy person I was, and am, to set up a leadership school for girls. So I went to Akuse, and I was privileged to meet a chief who is or was a visionary. He passed last year, unfortunately, before we could bet the school. So we went into partnership, and he sold me, at a very good price, an affordable price, 62 acres of land. Now, I, I'm not easily intimidated, so I walked into um, IFC and spoke to the woman in charge then. And she bought into the vision. And they sponsored 40% of my business plan. And we have a beautiful business plan. I have tried to get equity from some people but the dream of the school on that 64 plot, 64 acres, is such that you need a lot of money, $9 million. So what did I do? I went to banks. Nobody wants a startup because the history of entrepreneurs in this our world is not interesting. They look at the business plan, which was done by an expert, because IFC does not deal with mediocre. And this will work. But nobody wants to take a chance. Even though I have established a business, which is ranked 34 on Ghana Club 100, 
I don't need any testimonial. I have built a five-story building from scratch to with the help of a bank loan, which I'm paying very well. The bank is aware and is very happy with me. But they are afraid of startups. So what do I do? I go and knock on doors, and some people are able to give me a little money. So we are starting it on a, what do they call it, um, face, face by face basis. And I say to the glory of God that we are starting this September and I'm with an all-purpose building but I haven't had any funding. And it's crazy, but Legacy School will come into being and they'll give me awards for it and forget the difficulties that we came through to do that. For two years, I have won 34 awards. And I wish that a lot more will hold the hand. And I'm sure all the people who are coming to give their testimonies will be able to give those testimonies because somebody believed in them. So Technosev, I stand here with a lot of pride and honor to be part of this wonderful initiative. This will change the course of things going on in Ghana because people will see that it's possible to dream. It is possible to dare to swim against the current because we need um, engine to be able to change our lot as Ghanaians. We can't keep on importing and, and not producing anything for ourselves. So I wish us a fruitful deliberation and sit by quietly and see this beautiful thing unfold. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Please, you can do better than that. Put your hands together for them. When I tell people she's my role model, they don't understand because they think role models are gender stereotype. Why is it? I mean, if you see how she manages her business and deals with her family, you will be amazed. She's a real role model. We are looking forward to hearing her closing remarks as chairman. And we want to quickly bring up uh, our next speaker, but I want to acknowledge our 66 pilot cohorts for the program. They are here. Please rise to your feet so we can acknowledge you better. These are the Albert Osseis of tomorrow. The Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs of tomorrow. Oh, you are, why are you clapping so reluctantly? Is that a military man I see there? Are you a soldier? Please take your seat. Great. So I'm sure we'll hear more about their story later on. As indicated, um, Technosev is the implementing partner. We're very privileged to have the country director, Emmanuel Toriel, to give us a short address. Please put your hands together for him. Honorable Rashid Babur, Minister of State, Private Sector Development. Honorable Dr. Avei Frim So, Regional Minister, Upper East, formerly Upper West, as I've just learned. The Chairman, Mrs. Helen Hagen, CEO of Linus Services. Ms. Sally Taylor, head of the Ghana, heads of diplomatic missions and members of the diplomatic corps, representatives from the development partner institutions, special guests, including CEOs present, our cherished entrepreneurs, our friends from the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Good morning, Aqua. It is with tremendous excitement that I stand before this impressive audience to announce the launch of Engine, which, as you now know, stands for Enhancing Growth in New Enterprise. I first want to introduce myself and the organization. Unlike Ellen, I like to talk about myself, but I've been given some time constraints. So I'll keep it to my name, and my head to I, and my function, Country Director for TechnoServe Ghana. A little bit about TechnoServe. TechnoServe is a nonprofit organization that develops business solutions to poverty by linking people to information and markets. Our work is rooted in the idea that hardworking people can generate income for their families and communities. With over four decades of proven results, we believe in the power of private enterprise to transform lives. We work with enterprising people in the developing world to build competitive farms, businesses, and industries. 
the constraints that prevent a market system from operating efficiently. We achieve this by doing the following. By developing capacity, by helping individuals and communities acquire skills, share knowledge, and apply the technologies needed to build successful farms and businesses. By strengthening market connections, by coordinating amongst industry players, and by connecting emerging businesses and farms to capital, networks, and suppliers. And lastly, by improving the business environment, by encouraging self-sustaining economic activity, by addressing the policies, information, and incentives that help markets function better. TechnoServe's origins trace back to the village of Adidome in Ghana. We have expanded throughout the years, but our main focus remains on, develop, on the developing world, because that is where we can have the greatest impact on poverty alleviation. We work in poor communities in over 30 countries, through Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Some impact, Worldwide TechnoServe in 2013 worked with over 1,500 businesses that generated $27 million in incremental revenues and worked with over half a million farmers that generated over $44 million in incremental revenues. We have been established in Ghana for a while, since 1961, and over the years have worked on a number of value chains and economic development activities. Today, we work on several value chains that play a major role in the livelihoods of many Ghanaians and that contribute significantly to the Ghanaian economy. We work in cocoa, maize, rice, soy, cowpeas, shea, and entrepreneurship development. We expect in 2014 to work with close to 200 entrepreneurs and close to 50,000 farmers. We expect these businesses and these farmers to generate 19 million in incremental revenues. We have a storied and successful experience in entrepreneurship development. We have run more than 35 business plan competitions in Africa, Latin America, and India, and worked with over 3,000 entrepreneurs. In West Africa, we have either very recently completed, are completing, or are soon to launch entrepreneurship development programs in Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Benin, and Mali. In Ghana, we ran a successful competition, some of you might remember, in partnership with Google Foundation, called Believe, Begin, Become, where we work with just under 100 entrepreneurs, some of whom are running today successful businesses. In fact, we'll hear from two of them later on this morning. Mr. Bahulu, who launched a successful pharmaceutical company, and whose products you might have used. And Mr. Gianco, who launched a successful IT business and whose services you might have procured. But enough about TechnoSir. Why another entrepreneurship development program in Ghana? Well, although the Ghanaian GDP has grown steadily at about 6 to 10% over the last years, the micro to small and medium enterprise sector has not followed suit. We have today high youth unemployment rates, alarming graduate unemployment rates, low success rates for MSMEs in Ghana compared to other countries, low access to business development services for MSMEs, low access to finance for MSMEs. So there are a number of constraints in the marketplace today. Yet we also know that the business environment in Ghana is favorable for entrepreneurship, that Ghanaians exhibit strong entrepreneurial spirit and that the government is prioritizing the growth of the MSME sector, given its importance to the Ghanaian economy. We, along with DFID, believe that engine with its, metho with its methodology of a competition followed by aftercare for the entrepreneur can help catalyze and stimulate entrepreneurship growth in Ghana. And this is why DFID has decided to fund this new exciting program that we will be implementing over the next four and a half years. And we thank David for that. <laughs> Ideas are commodity. Execution of them is not. That's a quote from Michael Dell, CEO of Dell Computers. I share this view that what differentiates a successful business from a failing one is not rooted in the idea itself, 
but rather in the execution of that idea. And so why we want to help entrepreneurs refine their business idea or existing business by helping them develop a strong business plan and then support them in the execution of that new venture. It may come as a shock to you, and indeed to myself, that for the first time in my life, I find myself quoting a former heavyweight boxing champion of the world, which honorable minister will agree with. Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan, so they get punched in the mouth. I find this represents well the realities that our entrepreneurs will be faced with. There will be tough obstacles the entrepreneurs will have to overcome and tough decisions to make. How to access financing, how to find buyers for the products or services that they intend to sell, how to hire the right people, how to choose between investments and why. And this is why we want to accompany these entrepreneurs over a year through the tumultuous journey of executing against the business plan we will have helped them develop. We want to be there side by side with these entrepreneurs to surpass these obstacles together and guide them to help them make the best informed decisions. I personally look forward to this journey and helping develop a vibrant and innovative MSME sector in Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for joining us on this momentous occasion for the launch of Engine. And thank you again to DFID for funding this very important initiative. Again, I cannot convey enough to you my excitement about the launch of this program. As I take one last look across the rooms at the next Richard Branson's of the world, I would say to these entrepreneurs in Richard's own very simple terms, Believe in your idea and never give up. Thank you. Madame Moise. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please put your hands together for him again. I, I just had a business idea. A service to teach uh, people how to say Akwaba and Madame Moise. <laughs> and to speak tree. So if I can get a few people, I'll, I'll do the business. <laughs> now, we want to bring you a presentation on the SME growth in Ghana. The man I'm about to introduce taught me economics. I don't look like it, but I studied economics at the university. <laughs> when we're in the university, if you get an A, A minus or B plus, you say, oh, I got, I got an A. If you get a C or D, you say, oh, the lecturer gave me a C. <laughs> so all, I won't tell you what my grade. All I'll say is that the grade I got, I got it. He <laughs> didn't give it to me. He taught me. Uh, uh, industrial economics as an elective and other, other subjects. So it's really a pleasure to see Dr. Festus Ebo Texan is a senior lecturer and economist from the economics department of the University of Ghana. And he's here to give us a presentation on SME growth in Ghana. Please put your hands together for Dr. Thank you, Bernard. Um, Not to wait too much time, I would um, salute all those on the high table. Um, the country director has already acknowledged their presence, but I will salute them and then observe all protocols. Um, I am in academia, so I'm not too used to giving speeches. Um, rather, I love to make presentations. and. It's an honor to be here to present something on growth of SMEs in Ghana. Um, so I'm quickly going to take you through a presentation on the growth of SMEs in Ghana and not um, speak to a prepared speech. Um, globally, SMEs are seen as productive drivers of economic growth and development. And when you look at the sub-Saharan African case, most SMEs have been the fuel that has driven economic growth and helped many countries to achieve their macroeconomic objectives. 
if anything at all, they are prolific job creators. And SMEs in South Southern Africa, by creating jobs, have helped in alleviating poverty and promoted the attainment of many of our social objectives. In Ghana, SMEs have been the cornerstone to employment creation. And like I just mentioned, they have played a role in poverty reduction and economic prosperity. On the basis of the fact alone, SMEs are known to produce almost 70% of our GDP, 92% of enterprises within our industrial sector are SMEs, and they contribute over 80% to employment. In addition, they have provided training and skills through the apprenticeship training programs to a large group of people who have not had a chance to obtain formal education or vocational education. They have also been a source of livelihood to a high percentage of the very poor people in Ghana. And the manufacturing sector, especially at the small scale end of that sector, has been a survival strategy where people have produced very simplified goods, very simple goods, to satisfy basic needs. The SMEs continue to serve as a platform for our country to develop indigenous entrepreneurship, not to rely on any other, I mean, I'm not being um, racist about this, but not to allow external um, business going to take control of our, our, our industries, but then to make sure, like, when in Kuma, one independence, the main idea of the industrial sector was to create an indigenous entrepreneur-driven entrepreneur economy. Um, the SMEs in Ghana, looking at the role that you've played, might look slightly different because when you compare them to other countries, it all depends on how you define SMEs and there are a variety of ways of defining SMEs. And for those of us in research, we have normally relied on the RPED and UNIDO definitions of, of SMEs, where we categorize micro firms as less than five, small between five and, and 19, medium between 20 and 49, and large, about 50 employees. I'm going to use this definition to lay the facts about our SMEs in Ghana and how they have grown over time. I have resisted the temptation of defining SMEs based on the value of fixed assets. And I'm doing this because in a country where our local currency continually depreciates against our for, uh, major foreign currencies, defining SMEs based on the value of assets in Ghana cities become as soon as possibly outdated because supposing you say that a small enterprise is a firm that has a minimum of 10 million Ghana cities as its value of fixed assets. In the next moment, in dollar terms, that is nothing when your currency is depreciating. So more often than not, we have relied on the size of employment as um, a definition of SMEs. Based on the industrial census by the Ghana Statistical Service, which is itself outdated, of course, that is the, one of the main problems that we have with with SMEs and firms within our industrial sector. Based on the distribution from the census, you can clearly see that over 90% of, of firms are either micro or small, and only a few of them are medium or large. And if you take the private sector in manufacturing, SMEs constitute about 90% of activities in the private sector um, in our manufacturing subsector. Unfortunately, most of them are informal. And when I say they are informal, they are unregistered, they do not keep book of accounts, they do not have any business address or location. And this has been one of the main reasons responsible for their limited access to finance, especially from the former financial system. 
In a recent study that I did with a few of my colleagues, we also observed that ownership of SMEs are dominated by Ghanaians, with the male slightly dominating the female um, firms, owned firms. We also noticed that SMEs are located usually within a narrow defined geographical area, and you can talk of the major cities of Accra, Temara, Kumasi, and Takradi. With regards to labor productivity, based on the World Bank Enterprise Survey, we observed, I want to talk about labor productivity, we are looking at output per worker. We observed the food sector to be the most productive and the textile least productive. We also observed that older firms are more productive than younger firms, foreign owned firms more productive than our domestic firms. With regards to skills, we found the food sector to be more skilled than all other sectors. And when we talk about school, we are looking at a number of years of experience of the, of the top manager of these enterprises. And we noticed that the textiles were the least skilled. With regards to wages, it followed the same pattern. And therefore, we found a high correlation between productivity and skills, and then productivity and, and wages. With regards to the growth pattern, it has become very difficult for researchers to try to look at the extent of growth with regards to the number of firms that are in the industrial sector. And then for each particular firm, to find out over time if that firm has been growing. Because when we collect data on SMEs, we do not go back to the same firms to find out five years down the line what has happened to employment and all of that. So we are always going to the field to collect data on the, our research topics and come back. We don't go back to the firms. But in a study that I did with a group of, of colleagues in 2002 and, and then in 2010, we asked the firms to give us their employment sizes in the past, and then we looked at that compared to the current. We noticed that the missing middle distribution of firm sizes, which is the norm in most developing countries, you have a large number of micro small enterprises, and then almost non existent middle to large um, group of firms. And we noticed in Ghana over time that that missing middle distribution has gradually been disappearing, which is good. And what we observed was that we find some micro firms going into smaller firms, but not beyond that. We also find small firms still remaining small. And the entire life, those who die, die small. Some medium firms drop down to a lower size category because they are not able to survive running on, on uh, as million firms. And very few firms hardly grow beyond their size threshold. And so we, we plotted that. So this, this chart here shows the, the past. The, the red curve shows the past where you see it looks like a U shape. And then the blue is the current and, and shape. So when I say the missing middle is, 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 is disappearing, you can see that small firms, micro firms, have had an, those that were very micro firms have moved, some of them have moved to micro two. So micro two firms move into small one, small one firms to two. But then we do not have a lot of them moving into the um, higher size uh, thresholds. So then, we ask ourselves questions like, so what is inhibiting the, the growth of our SMEs into high size thresholds? And one of the main, in fact, the main factor that was, has been responsible for that has been access to credit, but not limited credit. In fact, the, the resources are available, but the former financial institutions are reluctant to lend to SMEs for a variety of reasons. So it is not that there are no resources that are available. And so for us, we ask the question, is it lack of access to finance or the resources that are not available? And various studies that have sought the perception of SMEs have been told by these SMEs that access to credit is the constraint. It's not that the credit is not available, but you cannot access the credit. 
And this has been confirmed by most of the studies that most of the studies that I have, I have projected there all concluded that it is rather lack of access to finance. But why are the banks reluctant? Why are the former financial institutions reluctant to lend to SMEs in Ghana? There's a volume effect. Most of our micro firms need very small loans, and processing such loans comes with a high cost. You know, cost. So the banks will want you to come for a bigger loan, and some of these firms do not have the capacity to go for that. In addition, because of the financialization of economic activities, these banks have other sources that they can, they can, they can send those resources into, and therefore, they lack the long-term resources that these SMEs need to be able to invest over a long term, and they are willing to give them those loans. Information asymmetry has been the main reason, and I mentioned that most of our SMEs are informal in outlook. They don't keep book of accounts. They are not registered. There is no location. These are the sort of things that the banks look out for. For which reason, if you do not have, then they find you to be a risky borrower, and therefore they are unwilling to lend. And so normally what they've done is to come up with very huge collateral requirements that these SMEs are not able to meet. In fact, for the few SMEs that will have that that might to, to meet their collateral requirements. They've had to borrow at very huge interest costs, which is entirely not their, their fault. It's a fault of our public sector, because our governments over time have been relying on domestic borrowing, increasing the treasury bill rate, and therefore they cut out the private sector from the credit market. And that has been one of the main problems that we face as we speak, and therefore, You've had a situation where these SMEs, even though the finance is there, they cannot assess the finance because they cannot pay. I mean, and I'll share a personal experience. Just somewhere last week, I had a call from my bankers who said they noticed that I've been banking for the past 22 years, and therefore they had a package for me. So I got excited, I asked, what package do you have? They said, we are willing to give you a loan of 100,000 Ghana cities because you've been with us for a long time. And we know you work with the university, you've working with the university for the past 15 years, we know how much you are paid, and you know you can pay. That's at what interest? And then the gentleman said to me, at 30% per annum. So if, if a, a low risk defaulter like me is going to pay 30% 30, 30 for a loan, how much more an SME that is informal in outlook and will need assistance? I mean, that means that they, they cannot pay. Now, another inhibiting factor has been the regulatory institutional environment. This has also, and like she, she, um, uh, Madam Chairperson Char mentioned, high startup cost has killed a lot of initiative in our potential entrepreneurs. They have the ideas, they have the plans, but because the cost of starting up is so high, they cannot find their, their, their ideas. Those that have to start find that licensing and registration requirements are so cumbersome. Currently, the World Bank's doing business database in Peters show that for you to license or register a new business, it's going to take you 14 days and eight documents, which is an improvement in what we've already had. Another fact has been high taxes and also excessive delays in settling disputes and enforcing contracts. In fact, in Ghana at the moment, it will take you 495 days and 36 documents to enforce a contract if there's any disputes that come in. Then there's high production costs, which is also a big issue. Unreliable power supply, high utility and fuel prices, exchange rate depreciation, lack of imported inputs, increase in the cost of doing business. And for a firm that wants to even set up and then get power to even um, generate its, its plant, it takes 79 days to install it or suit in your premises and 34 days to register a property. And these have all increased the production cost of SMEs. Finally, there are other factors, some of which 
the engine program is, 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 is supposed to, to help out. Of course, entrepreneurial attributes also play a role. The, size, the age, the level of education, the sort of training that the entrepreneurs receive also have an impact on, on growth. Lack of access to appropriate technology, the existence of laws and regulations that impede development of the SME sector, weak institutional capacity, and lack of management training and skills. These are all factors that we found in our various research that hinder growth. So what needs to be done? Government should create a congenial macroeconomic and business environment for SMEs. The, our country should, especially our commercial banks, should develop financial models that will inform SME finance because these are a group of firms that have peculiar needs and we know they are risky. How do we build models for us to reduce the risks that they, they carry? for us to be able to give them um, uh, resources. We should also encourage our SMEs and entrepreneurs to form cooperatives, because that is one way you can minimize the uh, default rates. Because when you go in a group to, to borrow, the banks are willing to, to give out the resources. I encourage the formation of social and business networks. This is very important because if young firms are going to survive, they need social business networks, those other firms that have been in, in in the field for a long time to help them grow. Right? And it's very important that we encourage that. Business support services should also um, be made available to SMEs for them to take up opportunities when they, they find them and even have that desire to export and go and compete on, on market. Finally, we should also develop efficient institutions that are indispensable to the function of input and output markets, minimize regulations and licensing procedures that affect the cost of doing business. When we do this, it's going to motivate those firms that are informal to, to register or formalize their operations because if the cost of doing that is very low, then they have an incentive. And also improve the business environment, like I mentioned, to reduce the cost of, of doing business. And finally, government's preferential treatment of large companies as against smaller companies should stop. Rather, we should concentrate on supporting the smaller companies and, um, because they make a greater chunk of our SMEs, uh, our industrial sector. And therefore, if our industrial sector is going to lead the, the growth of our economy, we need to concentrate on these SMEs and not give professional treatment to the very large firms. Um, to conclude, I, I must say that this engine program is, is, is it's a very good program. Of course, if you look at the, the, um, the, the way out that I've mentioned, two main ones are one to get finance for the entrepreneurs. And therefore, if engine is trying to do something of that sort, then it's good. Also, in terms of building the cooperatives among the entrepreneurs for them to be able to support each other, help them with business plans and all of that. These are things that will help of course, the NGOs can help in doing that, help SMEs to grow. But then, if our SMEs are going to grow, then a lot depends on our, our government to try to support them. I'm saying this because I have a very powerful government delegation here. And like I said, I'll state the facts as it is, and then leave it to them. They call the shots after all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A senior lecturer. So this is a very good baseline for all of us. We believe that uh, TechnoServe is, is, I'm sure, cognizant of these issues, as is UK Aid and those who are implementing the project. So we want to now hear from the head of Defeat Ghana, Sally Taylor, who would give us an overview of engine. Please put your hands together for them. Honourable Minister of State for Private Sector Development. Honourable Deputy Minister of Trade, Honourable Regional Minister for Upper East, our Chairperson, our colleagues and friends and all the distinguished guests here this morning. It's really a pleasure to be here this morning at the launch of this programme. Economic development is a really major priority for the UK's assistance in Ghana and indeed across the world. My minister uh, 
She always talks about economic development. She's always looking for more that we can do to really help countries to grow and to create jobs. And I think that's very much because of how important it is in terms of being able to tackle poverty and so the governments can sort of collect tax, can support business, so people can have jobs and can earn incomes and can provide for their families. I think everywhere in the world, to really tackle poverty well, to really develop, you need economic growth, and the private sector is where it's going to come from. So it's something that is increasingly part of our programme, and it's also something that uh, my Prime Minister, David Cameron, has been talking about in the international discussions on what might replace the Millennium Development Goals and really emphasising this need to think about how economies can transform, how jobs can be created, how people can be enabled to have gainful employment, earn income. And so we very much hope that this will feature largely in the new MDGs when they're agreed. But it is a very challenging thing to do. Here in Ghana, we've got a number of different initiatives we're beginning to, um, a program that we're supporting in the north of Ghana is looking at how we can help agricultural markets work better so that farmers can earn a better income and the rural entrepreneurs can do a bit better. And that's really about how we can help markets work.